Bismillah Rabbil Alamin Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd All praise is due to Allah And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His companions and all those, all those who follow them on the righteous path Until the day of judgment Let it grow with a natural flow I'm not a rapper So don't think I was trying to you know, rap to you tonight With this particular title But it's fine to rhyme the Quran rhymes, right? So rhyming is fine if it's done in a poetic fashion for poetry purposes as long as you don't think you're 50 halalas or people of his likes. Uh, let it grow with a natural flow. It's a very ambiguous title. And you may have been thinking, what in the world is he going to speak about? Um, is it children growing? Is it, you know, I've, I've ha had people guess. And alhamdulillah, uh, I've received failure uh, so far. Some had an idea, but you will discover. Uh, before I tell you what it is, because I like to make it a, a, a surprise, I guess, uh, let me mention to you that we have mentioned numerous times that among the things or the characteristics which make Islam the only true religion of God is its comprehensiveness. What does that mean? It includes everything. There isn't anything in this life Except that Islam tells you how to conduct yourself in that area. Whether it is social, economic, spiritual, uh, or otherwise. And uh, if this is understood, if Islam is comprehensive, then let's agree on some foundations. Do you all agree, if you're a Muslim, that is, if you're not, we hope you join the crowd soon. It, do you all agree that everything that we have in Islam is from Allah? Yes. Any objections? No. no objections. Are you sure? Because if you object, you'll be in trouble with us later on. Yeah. So we all agree. Quran and Sunnah, authentic Sunnah, is from Allah. Type. Now, knowing the greatness of Allah, knowing the majesty of Allah, knowing the power of Allah, do you believe that Allah will legislate something that is unimportant? Could there be something that is not really important, but Allah revealed it anyways? Sent Gabriel, the greatest of angels, all the way from above the seven heavens, down to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, who in the process had to suffer sometimes. The weight of the revelation which was given to him, he would sweat on a cold day or a cold night. Do you think... All this happened for something unimportant to be revealed? I don't think so. So every single aspect of Islam is significant and has a role to play in our relationship with Allah. Whatever it is, it will be, it will be granting you faith, stronger faith, bi'ithnillah, it will get you closer to Allah and it is another ridge from the ridges of the key with which you will open the door of paradise, bi'ithnillah. So we must agree. Because I know some of the people who follow their desires may object later on. Not you here, anyone who could be listening to this in the future. So if we lay down these foundations, then everything else will be, will be as they call it here, gir gir, right? It will be of no value because we agree to the foundations. So you agree everything is from Allah. You agree there's nothing insignificant. Good. One of these teachings that has been considered for whatever reason unimportant or insignificant so much so that the vast majority of the Muslim Ummah has totally abandoned it is the yes. beard yes. oh mashallah now some of you are thinking what? brother you brought me all the way from Hayy al Aziziyah or wherever you live and I drove 40 minutes so you can talk about a beard? What is so, how, how long can you elaborate on a beard? I mean, it's a five minute talk, right? It's either wajib or sunnah, and everybody goes home. Well, guess what? This ain't the case. It's way beyond that. This beard, this poor beard. Now, before I continue, hold on. This is very tough for me. Because I hate to hurt any Muslim's feelings. Obviously, I should, and you should feel the same way, because we should love each other for the sake of Allah, right? However, some of the things which will be mentioned tonight 
might hurt your feelings. So I'm gonna give you a solution from now. If you are beardless, beardless, or you suffer from beardlessness, please imagine that you had a beard, okay? Just close your eyes for a second and imagine you had a big old beard like that. So anytime I say something which may be offensive to you, say, oh, I have a beard. He's not talking about me, okay? This is one of the solutions I can give you. There's nothing much more that I can do. If you don't have a wild imagination, I'm sorry, okay? Maybe you could purchase one down the street. But until such time, I need you to imagine that because some people will get their feelings hurt, say this brother's trying to pick on me, make me feel bad. No, I'm not. But I have to share this information with you because if I don't, I'm betraying you. Because many people don't know. They would love to act, but they have no knowledge. So, get ready for this joyride, I guess, concerning the reality of the beard in Islam. For the sisters, allow me to apologize ahead of time. Because some of you are thinking, well, I don't have a beard. Alhamdulillah, I hope you don't, that is. And if this is the case, then you may be thinking, what am I gonna you know, discuss tonight? There's nothing for me. There is something for you, sisters. You will see what kind of role you will play in the beard of your husband, son, father, uncle, whoever. You have a role to play and we will need you sooner or later. So don't feel that you are uh, uh, not the, you know, the center of attention because next lecture inshallah is gonna be titled, is this woman going to Jannah? And it's going to be strictly about the women and you brothers are invited to come as well. So we try to give everybody their share. So yeah, the beard, huh? Let me define a beard for you. The beard, uh, don't say bird or, you know, beer or anything else. We have to, you know, say it correctly. Beard, even though it's spelled B-E-A-R-D, the English language sucks when it comes to pronunciations. But Allah understand. Let me give you the accurate definition. Uh, the beard is the hair which grows on the cheeks, the hair which grows on the temples, the hair which grows on the chin, according to some, the hair that grows on the lower lip, and the hair that grows on the bottom of your jaws, which includes your neck. This is very important because you will find that some people have another definition for a beard. They choose what they think looks cool and they say, oh, this is the beard for me. Well, we have to go back to the language of the Arabs. What was lihya, by the way, it's not called digin, even though you hear digin. Digin is your chin, okay? The lihya is the beard. We have to go to the definition of the Arabs, what they consider to be lihya. So let's repeat. It's the, fa it's the hair that grows on your cheeks, on your temples, that area between your eyes and your ears, your, the bottom of your jaws, which is your whole neck, and the chin, of course, and according to some, this hair that is on your lower lip. Some say it is not. This is where the difference of opinion is. I don't know of any difference of opinion concerning the other things which I mentioned to you. And before I tell you the ruling on the beard and other information, let me remind myself and you about some other fundamentals which we all should be aware of. When you bore witness and when you continue to bear witness on daily basis in your salah and otherwise, saying ashhadu an la ilaha illa allah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you are in fact taking a pledge of alliance or allegiance with allah that you will live according to la ilaha illa allah muhammadun rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it is not a statement which we say it is something which we live Speaking without action is called in the slang language, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Anyone can run their mouth about many things. If they don't act accordingly, excuse me. We don't need to hear it. So we need to act. When we bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that means that we really believe everything he taught us is from Allah and should be implemented in our lives. Let me give you some verses. Verse number one for the people with a good heart. If you have a good heart, you need one ayah or two ayahs in the book of Allah and your case is closed. If you have a good heart. If we have a good heart, don't think that I'm saying you, meaning I have one, Allah understand. If we had a good heart, the first ayah is, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily, you have in the Messenger of Allah a good example. 
If your heart and my heart, if they were sound, you don't need anything else. Oh, in him is a good example, I will follow his example. That's the first verse. The second verse for the brothers and the sisters with the sound heart and the good heart is the book, is the ayah in Al-Imran, verse 31 in particular. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ Say, if you truly love Allah, follow me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will love you. If we believed and our hearts were sound, that's all I need. What did he do? He did this, I want to do it. He left this alone, I never want to do it. This is the person who's what? He loves the sunnah. He loves the messenger of Allah. Not by statement, by acting upon that. See, this is an individual of a particular caliber. Some of us don't like to be like that. They're more stubborn, you know? You have to threaten. You know, some people you just invite them and they come. Some people, they don't come unless you force them. You handcuff them with their hands behind their back and you drag them by their ear. Then and only then you will come. I hope you're not of these kinds, but in case you were, or people listening in the future, let me give you some verses which will bring you in this fashion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا it is not for a believing man or a believing woman after Allah and His Messenger had decided upon any matter in this life of ours that you should have an opinion of your own. Oh, but I don't think, you know, brother, uh, you know, I don't think this is good. My, well, I feel that blah, 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 okay? I know the Quran and the Sunnah say that, but my father told me that such and such and such. People back home, brother, do Islam in this way, right? It's like you tell them the Quran and the Sunnah and they tell you some other silly stuff. Allah says, you don't have an opinion. You don't have an opinion. And if you disobey Allah and His Messenger, you have went in a clear, manifest misguidance and error. You are off the track, off one way to paradise. You have errors in connection. I'm not going to tell you all the titles of the lectures, but you know where I'm going. Right? So this is a threat from Allah. There's another one for you. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Let those who oppose the messenger beware that they may be afflicted with a fitna. Fitna, according to Ibn Kathir, as mentioned before, is either some shirk which will come into your life, suddenly your heart will become attached to a dead man in the grave. Huh? Suddenly, you will think that you should do things for the sake of people, not for the sake of Allah. And this will become your motivating, you know, uh, power in your life. Or, kufr, you may leave Islam altogether. You start going off the track, slowly but surely, until you exit from Islam. Very dangerous. Or, a bid'ah. You become, you know, impressed or astonished by some innovation that was innovated by an innovator and this becomes your way of life in Islam. This is the first category. The second threat from Allah is awadabun alim, or it may be a severe punishment in this dunya and in the life to come. For who? For those who oppose the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's why we have said before in our previous lectures, brother and sister do not look at the sin don't say, oh, but it's just, uh, you know, I do every now and then. That is destruction. It will destroy you. Whether you recognize it or not, whether you realize it or not, it will happen unless Allah wills otherwise. And we cannot gamble with that. Now, these are some. A third verse for those who like to be brought in a rough manner. وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَفْوًا نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مصيرا. Whoever opposes the messenger after guidance, guidance has become clear to him. Okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. But I deliberately go against it. Then, and then Allah added, and he chooses a way other than the way of the believers. 
we will allow him to travel upon this path. However, his abode will be the hellfire and what an evil abode. See, Allah will let them take the path which they want. No one will force someone to be guided. Allah will not force anyone to be guided. It is something that we ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we don't care, when we deliberately oppose the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we go against the way, his way and the way of the believers, Allah will let us take that path. But then Allah told us the outcome on the Day of Judgment. And we cannot afford that. So my brothers in Islam and my sisters in Islam, we will not be guided unless we follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who Allah said about in the Quran, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Obey Allah and the Messenger, perhaps you will be shown mercy. If you don't obey Allah and His Messenger, no mercy. وَإِن تُطِعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا If you obey Him, you will be guided. According to the ulama in the ilm of tafsir, there's something called mafhum al-mukhalafa. Meaning, the opposite meaning is understood without the need to mention it. Which is understood, meaning if you don't follow Him, if you don't obey Him, you will not be guided. If you obey Him, you will be guided. Meaning, if you don't obey Him, you will not be guided. This is an intro. So the reality of the beard, you will think twice before you say, well, yani, brother, I don't agree. And if you don't want to agree afterwards, that I conveyed the message. So these are verses that introduce this topic, so we will know. Tayyip, before I tell you the ruling, let me give you some evidences. Because many people have a huge misconception about the beard. They think it's like, uh, it's like part of you know, fashion. Brother, you know, today, you know, according to fashion, I think your pants should be somewhere below your shoes, you know, below, not below your ankles, below your shoes. It's a fashion that you step on the back, you know, so it will look like, you know, you've been walking in the streets. And I think your hair is a little too short. Why don't you have, you know, a big old afro, you know, so you look like you're a mop, or I'm sorry, a broom, anytime there's, you know, something we can just clean it up with. And now, your beard, it really is not really looking very nice. Brother, you know, nowadays people love, you know, beauty. You should look beautiful and, and clean. This is dirty. This face on your face is so filthy, you need to take it, you know, out. So you get some funny people, huh? They're very serious. Now, you know, I'm joking. Some people are dead serious saying this information. They, you, they think we're crazy when we do these things. But, Allah al musta'an Evidence number one, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha in Sahih Muslim wherein the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said there are 10 things that are part of the fitrah. Remember the word fitrah? If you have been attending the natural disposition, the natural way of things. And he mentioned 10 things among them is trimming your mustache or are trimming your mustache and letting your beard grow. Part of the natural disposition of a man, not a woman, a man is that you let your beard grow and you trim your mustache. Evidence number one. Evidence number two, the hadith of Ibn Umar in Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet sallallahu said, Anhiku shawarib wa u'fu liha. Anhiku is like a, a strong Arabic word. Now the scholars have differed about the mustache. Let me give it to you from now. Do you shave it or do you trim it? Does it have to be long? Is it only not going beyond the upper lip? I'm not going to discuss the mustache tonight. Whichever opinion you follow among the madhahib, that's a whole other discussion. But he said, U'fu al-liha. U'fu is like grow. Right? And the beautiful thing about the beard is that it grows on its own. Imagine if you had to go like this for your beard to grow. You know, if you had to push. Like every, every day for half an hour, you know, you sit in your room and you... You push in your face, so, so you start, you know, hair starts sprouting out, you know, like a tree. Say, brother, push more, push more. Of course, some people push too much until other things come out, and that's a whole other discussion. But the point being, you don't have to do that. Nor do you have to go to some Chinese acupuncture who will put some needles in your face, you know, with a thread, and then go in there and like pull out a hair. You know, say, okay, we got one out. Now do we have 2,000 to go? Right? And he's sitting there like, I don't think I need a beard anymore, right? Because this is going to be too painful. Nor do you have to, you know, go stand in the sun after you put some, uh, you know, fertilizers on your face, you know, and you go on this side for like this half an hour getting some sun, you know, and you put some water every now and then. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is go to sleep and go to work the next day and go to sleep and go to the work the next day and within a week, boom, you got it. Some, you know, faster than others. 
Some, mashallah, within two days, you know, it's, they don't, you know, they have to put it in their pocket. And some like myself have been waiting for many years. Alhamdulillah, it grows according to Allah's decree. But either way, the point is you don't have to do anything. It comes on its own. But you need to grow it. The third uh, evidence is the hadith of Abu Hurairah who said, Juzu al-shawarib wa arkhu al-liha. Again, trim your mustache. Arkhu is like release. That's if like it's been imprisoned, right? And just release it. Let it go. Third, and then he said at the end, Khaliful al majus. Distinguish yourself from the Magians, yeah, the fire worshippers, right? They have a different ways of, of uh, different names, but Majus are Magians. Don't look like them, okay? Trim your mustache, release your beard. Evidence number four, Hadith of Ibn Umar, again in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Khaliful Mushrikeen, this time, Wafiru al liha wa ahfu al shawarib. Distinguish yourself from the polytheists, from the idolaters. Let your beard grow. Well, this one he said, what you like save? You know, save it. When it grows, don't do anything to it. And trim your mustaches. Right? Now he said, distinguish yourself from the polytheists. The fifth evidence, a very sensitive one. Pay attention. This is a story where the Persian king Kisra required or asked the Yemeni ruler at his time to send two envoys to the Prophet ﷺ to summon him. When they went to him, these two people appeared in the following fashion, as explained in the hadith. They had let their mustache grow and they had their beards, their beards shaved. You know what the hadith says? The Prophet ﷺ he hated looking at them. He hated looking at them. Meaning, pay attention. If you today were to meet the Prophet wasallam and he sees you with this appearance, he would not like looking at you. Would you want that? Would you want the Messenger of Allah to go like this? As he did with the men? Then you know what he said to them? Waylakuma. You remember? Fawailun lil musalleen. Wailun li kulli humazatin lumaza. Wail is a big word in the Quran and the Sunnah. Woe to you. Yani you are on the road to destruction. He said, Wailakuma man amarukum amarukuma bihada. Woe to you who commanded you to do this to yourselves. Because it was so unappealing, so repulsive. Qalu amaruna rabbuna kisra. They said, Our Lord. Kisra, they used to worship him with the fire, had commanded us. قال فإن ربي أمرني أن أعف لحيتي وأقص شاربي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, Well, my Lord, my Lord commanded me to let my beard grow and trim my mustache. This is one of the most important narrations in this discussion here, because he disliked, he hated looking at them. Because of that appearance of them, of theirs. Whereas he said, Allah commanded me. Is it insignificant? I don't think so. Tay. Ruling. You know what? You give me the ruling. I'm not gonna give you the ruling. I think you heard enough for you to tell me the ruling. What is the ruling? Up to you, my brother? Is it up to you or is it a sunnah? Mustahabba? Or is it a fard? Can I hear some, something? <coughs> fard? You know the word fard. You've heard of the Al-Fara'id Al-Khamsa? The five obligatory prayers? What does fard mean? It's not up to you, my brother. You must do it. It's an obligation. Compulsory. Use any English word you like. Urdu, Chinese, I don't care. Whatever you understand from that word, fard, it is what you need concerning your beard. You may say, Maybe I'm an extremist. Of course, by now, I'm sure you think that I am an extremist. I have no problem with that. Nowadays, if we try to hold on to the deen, we become extremists. That's fine. But let me tell you what the ulama used to say. Right? So you will know that I'm innocent. Inshallah. I'm very innocent. I'm not an extremist. Ibn Abidin, this is among the Ahnaf. The Hanafi Madhab. 
if you love the Hanafi madhab rahimahullah ta'ala fi al-dur al-mukhtar he said yuharram halq al-lihya wa amma al-akhd minha wa hiya dun al-qabd kama yaf'aluhu yaf'aluhu mukhannathatu ar-rijal falam yubihhu ahad it is haram to shave your beard as for taking any part of it be, be, uh, before the fist, the grip, because let me give you the ruling right now. According to some of the Sahaba, like Ibn Umar and Abu Hurairah, Hurayra, they used to, when their beard was beyond their grip, if they grabbed their beard like this from the chin downwards, whatever was beyond that, they cut it off. And no one can dispute that. Whether you like this opinion or not, Alhamdulillah. And to let it get to this part, then we can discuss it. Because usually who complains? A brother with no beard. He tells you about Ibn Umar and Abu Hurairah I used to do it. Akhi, you make it until your beard is that long, then we will have the discussion part two. You don't even have anything now. So I mean, <laughs> come on now. Right? That doesn't work. So if you, if you are following the opinion of these Sahaba, Alhamdulillah, no one can deny that. If your beard is so long, MashaAllah, and you don't want it to be that long, Right? You want it to be only a fist long, if your hand is big than according to your hand, then anything after that, we say it is allowed according to, th to some of the ulama. ulama, and we don't want to dispute that. But you know what the Imam said? He said, as for removing any part of the hair, which is before you reach that point, that as it is done by the womanish men, sorry, feminine men, Men who are like women, he said this was not allowed by anyone. We don't know of anyone who allowed this. Sorry again, imagine you had a beard. You don't have one, imagine you had a beard because inshallah, I believe if, if Allah guides my heart and yours, and if your heart is sound, you will never shave your beard again after I'm done tonight. So even if you don't have it now inshallah, next week you will have it. So don't feel bad now, it's the time for tawbah. Right? But make sure you do the tawbah. This was the ahnaf if you're a Hanafi, and we don't, we don't suggest that you follow any madhab blindly. But just in case you love Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, this is what his madhab used to teach. Let's go to the Malikiyya. According to Ibn Abdul Bar, Fit Tamheed, it's a book of the Hanbali, uh, Afwan, the Maliki madhab. He said, يُحَرَّمُ الْحَلْقُ اللِّحْيَا وَلَا يَفْعَلُهُ إِلَّا الْمُخَنَّثُونَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ Again, it is forbidden to shave the beard, and it is only done by womanish men. <coughs> Womanish men, those who don't have the full characteristics of men. This is the Malikiyya. According to the Shafi'iyya, a Shafi'i in his book Al-Um, the famous book which he authored, Rahimahullah, he said, يُحَرَّمُ حَلْقُ اللِّحْيَا It is forbidden to shave the beard. And among the uh, 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 Shafi'iyya was Imam Al-Nawawi, Al-Zarkashi, and all of them were of the same opinion as their Imam in the Madhab. And last but not least, if you follow the Hanbali Madhab, or you appreciate what they have to say, then it's said by As-Safarini fi ghidai al-albab yuharramu halqu al-lihya Again, it is forbidden to shave the beard and this is the opinion of the madhab. So the four madhahib are against the person who shaves his beard. None of them allowed it. So those who follow the madhahib blindly, usually anytime you give him a sunnah, what is his excuse? Brother, not in my madhab. Akhi, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came into the masjid, he said, do not sit down until you pray tahiyyatul masjid. Some brothers walk in, make sure no Saudi is around to see him, boom, he sits down. Huh? Because he knows if some other man saw him, he's gonna get up and pray, get up and pray. So he doesn't want to hear any, you know, any, anyone commenting. He makes sure that this, you know, the area is clear. Let me grab a seat. I don't want to pray tahiyyatul masjid. If you were to go and speak to him, he said, brother, I'm a Hanafi. And according to the Ahnaf, it's just an option, optional, you don't have to do it. Right. So you will find that people always give you the excuse of what? He may be lazy, by the way, and he may be really following the madhab, only Allah knows the intention. But it's the excuse given. That if someone was really following the madhab so much, then why do they oppose the madhab? And even worse, oppose the Prophet ﷺ in these matters. If you're really a Hanafi and you don't have a beard, you're not a Hanafi. You are following Imam Abu Hanifa according to your desires. When it contradicts your desires, you're not a Hanafi anymore, you are me. Not me, you. You see what I'm saying? Meaning your madhab is, is whatever I like. Madhabi. Not madhab Abu Hanifa, rahimullah, not Shafi'i, not anyone. Madhabi. That's what I like, brother. That's what I do. 
So we need to stop, you know, fooling ourselves. Because fooling ourselves means we're trying to fool Allah. Because Allah knows everything we conceal. Fooling the people works. You know, it works. Fooling Allah, never. So even if we get by in the dunya, we will not get by on the day of judgment. So we need to stop this. Either we follow the sunnah, or we don't follow the sunnah. To put the madhab as an excuse is not an excuse. And guess what, inshallah, there will be a lecture dedicated to this whole, uh, you know, uh, conflict of madhahib and how to deal with it adequately, bi'idhnillahi, azza wa jal. Ethan, all the madhahib are not with you. Ibn Hazm fil muhalla had mentioned the ijma'. Who remembers what the word ijma' means? Come on, we need to work on our da'wah terminology. Ijma' in English. Consensus, thank you sir. Consensus meaning the unanimous agreement of the ulama. Ibn Hazm and Ibn Taymiyyah and others mentioned they don't know of any alim at that, at that time, in the early generations, that ever said that it's okay for you to do anything to your beard. That is beyond, you know, before the grip. Not even a alim. Ijma' meaning, and by the way, FYI, what does FYI mean for your information? There are, ma there are not many things which the ulama have agreed upon. You see? Often, if you, if you buy a book of Al-Madhahib Al-Arba'a, you will hardly find them agreeing on one fiqh issue. There's always difference. For them to agree is very rare. So when they agree on something, there's really no room for anyone to go beyond that. So this is what they said. Ibn Taymiyyah added something interesting. He said, فَأَمَّا حَلْقُهَا فَمِثْلِ حَلْقِ الْمَرْأَةَ الْمَرْأَةُ رَأْسِهَا وَأَشَدْ لِأَنَّهُ مِنَ الْمُثْلَى الْمَنْهِ عَنْهَا وَهِيَ مُحَرَّمَةً He said, a man shaving his beard is equal to a woman shaving her head. Imagine if your wife came out of the bathroom one day and she was bald. <laughs> Are you okay? So this is the new style. You didn't see? You know, blah blah singers, I don't care, you know, there was this singer back in the day, this big, you know, I, don't, I forgot her name, alhamdulillah, this was in Jahiliyyah, who used to be bald. What a strange, you know, appearance. Of course, if someone has a disease, alhamdulillah, all of the creation of Allah is good. But someone who deliberately, I mean, if a woman shaved her head, I mean, you're speechless. He said, a man shaving his beard is equal to a woman shaving her head, rather it is worse. Because it is muthla. You know what muthla means? Mutilation. You know what mutilation means? If someone died, if someone died in a battlefield, some of the enemies would get him and deliberately distort his appearance. They would cut his nose. They will They will make him look disturbing. So much so that when you see him, you will not be able to recognize him anymore because of the mutilation which they have done to him. The ulama considered shaving the beard as mutilation. You know how severe, meaning you are distorting yourself. And I will mention to you something inshallah, which should be part of wisdom, that will make you reconsider the actions of the Muslims today. Tayyip. Furthermore, this was the opinion of Al-Barak Fouri, Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Muflih, Ibn Al-Qayyim, I mean all of the ulama. So let me tell you something. Maybe I haven't convinced you, okay? Maybe you still think, well, you know, there's room for me to follow because I think it's fine. Let's go to the other side of the coin. There are things called violations. When you don't obey, it's at different levels. You may disobey Allah's messenger and the consequences will be a sin. Okay? A single sin. You may disobey Allah's messenger and the consequences are what? A sin which you may do a good deed 10 minutes later and erase it, right? Sins, we said, are at different levels. You smoking at home is a sin. You smoking in public is double trouble and multiple sins because you're harming yourself, you're harming people around you, you are disobeying Allah publicly and a list, the list goes on. Let me tell you some violations that are a consequence of one playing with his face. Violation number one, it is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Evidence, the one I quoted earlier, the hadith of the Magians, who the Prophet said, my Lord commanded me. So when you play with your beard, you are disobeying Allah because Allah commanded the Muslims to let their beards grow. 
Violation number two, you're disobeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And I quoted the verses earlier which threaten us from disobeying him sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Furthermore, Allah says, وَمَن يُطِعَ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ Whosoever obeys the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. So when you disobey the messenger, you're again disobeying Allah. Violation number three, you are opposing the way of the messengers and the prophets. The hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim, he described the Prophet ﷺ as being كَثِيرُ شَعْرِ اللِّحْيَةِ He used to have a, a, a big beard alayhi salatu wasalam. It was abundant in his hair, it covered his whole face, so much so that when he, he would lead them in salah, they will know that he's reciting from the movement of his beard from the side of his face. Big beard sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, if your beard doesn't grow that much, you're not expected to do that. We're showing you that he left it alone alayhi salatu wasallam. You're opposing him. You're opposing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and all of the messengers. In the Quran, Harun said to Musa, Yabna um, la ta'khud bi lihyati wa la bi ra'si. Oh, son of my mother, trying to be compassionate to him, do not grab me by my beard and by my head. Harun in the Quran told his brother Musa, don't grab me by my beard. Lihyati. Meaning he had a what? He had a beard. Subhanallah, in the Quran, the beard is mentioned. The mutawwi'in are in the Quran. If this is the title that the people who don't have beard like to give to the people who have a beard. It's one of the funniest things in the world. You know, you go around someone who doesn't have a beard, oh, mutawwi' want the judge for the mutawwi'. Say, brother, you know, why don't you become a mutawwi' like me? I mean, why are you making this beard between me and you? I'm a mutawwi' and you are not. I mean, we have the same messenger, the same religion, the same God. If you want to call this title mutawwi', then we should both be in it together. And having a beard doesn't mean that you're mutawwi' in the ultimate sense, because you can have a beard and be busted. You can be disobeying Allah in all kinds of ways that only Allah knows about and your beard is, you know, making it to the ground. So we don't have, want to have a misconception every time we see a bearded man, say, MashaAllah, Shaykh al-Islam. Not necessarily. Okay? But it's usually a good indication that the brother has some sort of righteousness. This is why if you go to any place in the world and it's Salah time and they don't have an Imam, who's the Imam? The brother with the biggest beard. It's like as if the Quran he memorized grows out on his face. Even though the Sunnah is what? The one who knows the book, of, the book of Allah more. You may have a small beard and have the Quran memorized. And the brother next to you has a big beard, he doesn't know the Fatiha. <laughs> so anyways. Yeah. So you're going against the messengers. And Allah said, وَمَن يُشَاكِكَ الرَّسُولِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبَى غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ As I quoted earlier, if you oppose the messenger, after guidance has been made clear for you, and you follow the way other than the believers. And Allah warned us from both. So this is the third or fourth violation. I believe this is the third violation. Violation number four. You are imitating the kuffar. And that one is horrible. In the three narrations, one time he said, don't imitate the Magians. Distinguish yourself from the Magians. In another one he said, distinguish yourself from the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book, the people of the scriptures, the Jews and the Christians. In the third narration, distinguish yourself from the Mushrikeen. All of these, we are not supposed to resemble them. These are the enemies of Allah. That's the reality. They are the enemies of Allah. And in the Fatiha, every time we read the Fatiha, we ask Allah for the path of the believers and the prophets, and we ask Allah not to give us the path of those who have attained His wrath and those who are misguided. Guess what? It is them. So what kind of contradiction is that? That means that the Fatiha is worthless. It's just lip service. We ask Allah for things that we really don't want. Because I said, there's nothing easier than the beard. So if we really want guidance from Allah, and we don't want to imitate the Jews and the Christians, then how do we go about doing that? So you find someone, you know, getting a, a, a what do you call it, a goat, goatier? It's like a French word. And in, the only thing that I can think of is a goat. Goat? Goatier? And what is the goat? You know, the goat, the goat only has some, something, you know, chin that is, you know, hanging from here. So people try to uh, design themselves like an art piece. Which is, you know, they go to extremes. Now, I'm sorry again, anyone who has this, you know, imagine you had a beard. I don't have to remind you every 10 minutes. All this is not okay. 
We don't want to resemble them and their ways. We have our own special way. Subhanallah, we are the leaders. Be proud of it. We cannot be proud of many things. We cannot be proud of work because most of us do a horrible job at work. We cannot be proud of many things in our lives. But guess what? One thing we can and should be proud of is Islam. Allah made us Muslims and we are the chosen ummah. Today, there are no people on earth who worship Allah alone with no partners and follow His final messenger except the Muslims. Do we then go and follow and imitate the enemies of Islam and Muslims? Do we help them in any way, shape or form? I will not help them with their real, let alone my appearance. They are on one side and I am on the opposite. This is the deen of Allah. If you want to go to Jannah with, with honors, you know, today you want to, you know, graduate with honors. But if you want to go to Jannah with honors, not barely making it by going to the fire first, then we need to have this kind of attitude. I will resemble no disbeliever in any way, shape or form. If he wears his clothes this way, that's not me. If he did, whatever it is, things pertaining to their religion, that is, of course. And things that are not pertaining to religion, alhamdulillah, there's room. No one will force you to wear, uh, you know, a Pakistani outfit. You must wear a sirwal and qameez or, or you must wear a thawb. Alhamdulillah, there's room. But at the end of the day, we have our own identity. We never want to lose that. Fifthly, Oh, let me give you one more narration. Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِغَيْرِنَا لَا تَشَبَّهُ بِالْيَهُودِ وَالنَّصَارَى He is not one of us. He is not of us, the one who resembles others. Do not resemble the Jews and the Christians. He is not of us. He declared them to be foreign to the way and the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. He declared them to be divorced from that. He is not one of us. The one who doesn't, the one who imitates others. So, my brothers, particularly the youth, be proud of your Islam. Don't be following these lousy losers who have nothing to do except rap and sing about their women that they go out with in haram and the drugs which they smoke and the alcohol which they consume and the money which they make and the Bentley which they drive. These losers, what a loser. Uh, what, I mean, to what level? Like, like it's like for Aoun. Huh? Call. أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرُ وَهَذِهِ الْأَنْهَارُ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِي He said to his people, don't you see? Don't you see that Egypt belongs to me and these rivers are flowing under me? Of course the rivers eventually flowed over him and he was drowned. Furthermore, the ulama say this is one of the stupidest people on earth. You know why? Because he was bragging about something which he doesn't own. He didn't say, look at my character. I'm a wonderful, nice guy. He said, look at the rivers, look, he's, he is mentioning Allah's creation as if he's the one who made the rivers. As if in Egypt, he owned it. Who gave it to him? Allah. Even though he was his enemy, Allah gave it to him because this was his fitna in the dunya. So we don't, you know, we don't have this kind of attitude in any way, shape or form. So inshallah, I hope this is clear. Uh, fifthly, changing Allah's creation. The shaitan, among the things which he took it upon himself, when he was kicked out, as Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا أَمُرَنَّهُمْ فَلَا يُغَيِّرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ I shall verily tempt them, so they will change the creation of Allah. Among his goals is that he will make us change our ways. He doesn't want us to remain upon the fitrah. What does that mean? He will change the fitrah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, part of the fitrah is what? Letting your beard grow. And that includes the neck and everything. Now, what is important? Let me tell you something which we may not realize. When Allah created us upon this fitrah, does that mean that this is the best thing for us or not? Yes or no? Yes. When someone doesn't like the beard, it is as if he's saying to Allah, why did you give me or ask me to get something which is not befitting for me? So this constitutes a very dangerous belief system. Because when Allah gives you a beard and He says keep it, and you dislike what Allah gave you and made it part of your fitrah, you are in other words saying to Allah, you don't know what you're doing. Don't you know that I'm supposed to be beardless? Why did you give me a beard? Because you gave me a beard, even though it's not suitable for me, I will take care of it, I will remove it myself. Now I'm not saying everyone who doesn't have a beard feels this way, right? I'm just saying that this is, this, this is what it may lead to. 
These may be very subtle that we don't even think about them. But think about that. When you believe in the fitrah of Allah and that you don't want the shaitan to change the creation of Allah, meaning you will be pleased with what Allah, how Allah made you. He told us to cut our nails, so we keep our nails clean and short. You know, we don't have long nails. Some people, you know, men keep a long nail, the pinky one. You know, for what? For cleaning. So in case you wanted to clear his ear, you know, you need to have something of easy access or something between his teeth. Nasty, man. You have, you know, cotton swabs and different things they invented for you to clean yourself besides your nail, a long nail. And for the sisters, you know, same thing can be said. You know, you're not a tiger. You know, wow. You know, suddenly you pull out these big nails. You should also cut them off. It's not from the sunnah of a woman to leave their nails long. And I saw an amazing thing today on an airplane. Unfortunately, I was, uh, whatever, I'm not going to tell you what I was doing. But the bottom line is, you know how they serve you juice, right? Uh, you know, through the aisle. And unfortunately, they, you know, women, are, it's always women. Sometimes you just want to jump out of the window, so you won't have to deal with all that. Uh, but of course, I, I look to my right suddenly, and I, first time I ever see this. The lady had a long nail, which had an earring. She pierced her nail. I was hoping this is not her real nail. I said, inshallah, this is an attachment that she glued, so she's able to, you know, design it. If it's her real nail, can you imagine? You know, people pierce their ears, you know, female, and this one says, pierce my finger, please. Here's my nail, you know, bah! And then he put an earring, and she, I mean, what are you, I was gonna tell her, are you serious? I mean, I've seen all kinds of crazy things, but this is the craziest I've ever seen. I mean, what do you want? What do you want, sister? Of course, I couldn't say all this because they're going to throw me out the plane, so I have to keep my mouth shut. But I'm saying, what does she want? What are you, what are you inviting the people to? Uh, you think you're cool? You're not cool, you know? And Jahannam is not cool at all. It's very hot. Cool is in Jannah. So if you want to be cool, you know, you better stick to the deen and act accordingly. So yeah, the bottom line is, then I don't know how I got there. Uh, yeah, when we don't keep these things, then we are, di we are dissatisfied with Allah's fitrah. So we should love what Allah made natural for us. If you truly love the fitrah, you're upon the fitrah. If you have a problem with the fitrah, meaning our fitrah is distorted. It has been changed because of our environment. Very much and very often it's the Western, Western ideologies and uh, concept of life. What, what they think is, is befitting is befitting and what they think is not is not. It's okay to have a girlfriend, what's, your, what's wrong with that? But if, if there was a war captive in Islam, which, you know, a, according to Islam, a right hand possession, they say, oh no, this is repulsive, why? Akhi, this is halal and this is haram. The only way you will have an issue with your heart, when someone says that, is because you have been brainwashed by the media. Where you reach a point where, oh, boyfriend, girlfriend, yeah, yani that's digestible. Even if they have a relationship, no problem. But, you know, owning a woman as a right-hand possession because of some war between the Muslims and others, oh, no, no. But that is from the deen of Allah. Now, of course, it's not, you know, applicable today because it's not happening. But that was the deen of Allah. This was what Allah gave the men as part of their victory. If you are complaining, you, you don't like what Allah revealed. But you like the kuffar's idea. Oh, having a girlfriend, wonderful. Let me send her an SMS. So this is what? Brainwashing. So are we brainwashed? Some of us may be. We need to clean ourselves from this. You know, we need to love the sunnah and the fitrah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fitratullah allati fatara nas alayya. It's the way of Allah which He had created the people upon. And we will not compromise it in any way, shape or form. And we can care less about any substitutes which the people offer. Sixthly or seventhly, imitating the woman's section. When you shave your beard, then you are imitating women who were created with a soft, tender face. Not for me and you. For the woman, yes. The Prophet وسلم, according to the hadith of Ibn Abbas, لَعَنَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم الْمُتَشَبِّهِينَ بِالنِّسَاءِ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ الْمُتَشَبِّهِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ بِالنِّسَاءِ وَالْمُتَشَبِّهَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ بِالرِّجَالِ Allah's Messenger وسلم, cursed the men who resemble women and the women who resemble men. When you shave your beard, you are imitating women. And this will bring about the curse of Allah. So we don't want to resemble women. They have a particular physical uh, 
you know, uh, whatever you call it, features, and we have our own. We don't do what they do, and they don't do what we do. There are two separate things that ever need to remain in this fashion. And lastly, or before lastly, public sinning. And the Prophet ﷺ said, كُلُّ أُمَّتِي مُعَافَى إِلَّا الْمُجَاهِرُونَ All of my ummah, all of my ummah will be safe. Except those who do sins publicly. When you shave your beard, or when you, you know, do a zigzag, you know, like a freeway. You know, go in, and you have a roundabout over here, and then you go down. You know, some people, you know, get really creative, spending maybe half an hour to an hour, and, you know, in front of the uh, mirror in the bathroom, you know, doing different kinds of stuff, right? If you do that, and some guy likes it, and he starts doing it, then his, friends like, his friend likes it, and he starts doing it, all of these will be on your book of evil deeds on the Day of Judgment. You are responsible for misguiding maybe millions of people you don't know. You may be the one who started the fashion and you may be destroyed because of that start. So it's not a joke. And public sinning is meaning I disobey Allah publicly, I could care less. Again, I know or I have a very strong feeling that most of our brothers here or those who will hear in the future didn't know all this. This is shocking. So don't feel bad. Okay? You're not to blame inshallah because at the Muslim Ummah suffers from what? Lack of knowledge. We don't really know much. So inshallah, if you, don't, you didn't know, inshallah, you're excused by Allah. And everything I'm mentioning is not applicable to you. When this becomes a problem, when we know now and we don't act, then I'm sorry for myself and I'm sorry for you. If this has become clear to you, Allah al musta'an. But if you didn't know before, brother, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. We all make mistakes. Each one of us is a sinner in his own way. Some, the sins appear on their face and some, they don't appear. It doesn't mean that if you don't have a beard, meaning everyone around you who has a beard is some, you know, righteous man. Not necessarily. We may have problems or diseases of the heart which are much more severe, much more severe than you shaving the beard. So it has to do with intentions, it has to do with the environment. Many things, keep that in mind. Because I don't want you to feel bad, right? I don't want you to feel guilty. We want us all to be a single brotherhood. You know, we have to share information like your friend. With your friend, you tell him, you know, you look ugly today. Right? Now if somebody told you down the street, if you're walking down the street and someone said, Ex excuse me, you look ugly. What will happen to you? The average man will knock him out. Say, yeah, I'll show you who's ugly. Bam. So now you look ugly now. Uh, that's, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't remember Allah often. But if your friend told you you look ugly, you say, oh, why, why? You know, this stuff doesn't look good on you. Okay, I will not wear it anymore. Right? So take me as a friend, I hope, or close to a friend. Where I'm just, you know, trying to, you know, help myself and you do better. Not that I'm sitting here trying to, you know, nail, uh, put nails in the coffin, as they say, trying to terminate you before you leave the lecture tonight. I'm all, you know, I'm, I know I'm a little mean, but that's my job sometimes as a lecturer. Anyways, we're coming to an end, inshallah. It's a waste of money and time. The last violation, it is a waste of money. I've mentioned before, Gillette or the other kinds which are available in the market are outrageously expensive. I mean, I buy the blades, right? Because there are other things you're supposed to shave, like your armpit and otherwise. And the blade is like 25 reals. Only the, the extra blade, which you put on top of the machine, you know, the tool, whatever you want to call it. When you buy the whole package, which comes, you know, the thing, and now they have batteries and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. It's around 100 something reals, 80 reals. That's a lot of money to spend to disobey Allah. Allah will ask us about this money. It's enough that we're spending it in the wrong way and we're disobeying Allah with the money. This is not being appreciative to Allah, for sure. Secondly, time. Do we have time every day to shave? How much time does it take? Wallahi, it consumes so much time. Whether you shave on your own or you go to the barber. And I told you what I saw at the barber, remember? Do you remember what I told, I told you before? Crazy stuff, man. We're living in a strange world today. Uh, the, the barber had a thread. This thread was like, a, I don't know, it's like a sewing machine, right? He would put it in between his teeth and he would fold it with some other thing and then he would put it on the brother's neck and he would go like this. I was sitting there like, brother, what are you doing? The man, you know, man, you know sitting there like, so he can get some hairs here removed. You know, or something along these lines and the man is sitting there looking like, you know, I don't know what. I'm not even going to compare him to anything. He looks like some, some alien. He's not even a human being. Going back and forth the whole time. Oh, oh, 
to, you know, spending, Allah knows I'm sitting there, you know, trying to get my hair cut, and I'm, I'm waiting and waiting, is this brother serious? How long does this take? Had you read the Quran and gotten, you know, thousands of good deeds, Wallah, it would have been better for you. Then all the time you're wasting, shaving your beard and trying to design it. So, you know, it's a waste of time, a waste of money. Conclusion. It is not befitting for any Muslim male, whoever hears this lecture from the beginning till the end, or even part of it, to ever shave his beard again. And Allah knows that if we don't obey and listen, let me give you a guaranteed reality, we have a disease in our heart. That's the reality. If we like that, and we are willing to meet Allah with this kind of heart, that's everyone's business. If I know this about myself, and I don't try to fix it, then I'm responsible for the consequences. And the same thing are applicable to you. Once you know, once you've heard all of this amazing information, which you never heard before, but I didn't bring it from my own mind. This is all available in the books. This is found online. This is nothing new that I'm bringing. If we still don't listen, we have a problem in our hearts. And we need to really revisit our Iman. Do we really believe in Allah and His Messenger? Do we really, really love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Do we really love to imitate him? Do we really want to go to Jannah? If all of the above you say yes, then you will no longer ever, ever be able to shave your beard again. Let alone take anything out of it if it doesn't go beyond your fist. Right? So I'm just imagining this, this right now I'm having this wonderful image that, you know, one day I give a lecture to a whole bearded crowd, except the sisters, of course. You know, come the sisters with beards also. Say, no, 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 you missed the lecture. I was addressing the men. That would be wonderful, imagine. Of course, they will be scared here. At the hospital, say, what happened to these guys, man? We need to stop this lecture before they become, you know, terrorists. But, you know, we don't care about what the people think. It would be wonderful if one day it was everybody with a big beard or a small beard. Some people don't have a long beard. You are not to be blamed. It's not like the bigger the beard, the more your iman. Like I said, some people are hairy, some people are not. As long as you're letting it go, even if it's one hair, you have done your job. And you are equal, maybe better in the sight of Allah, than the brother with the hugest beard in the world. Because it's a matter of obedience, not quantity. You follow me? Wonderful. Uh, sisters, help the brother out. If you see him acting silly, remind him. And please, don't be one of these ladies who say to their husbands, you don't look good, right? So sometimes you tell the brother, brother, why don't you leave your beard? He says, brother, you know, I would love to leave my beard, but my wife doesn't like it. Say, brother, my, your wife also doesn't like your stinky feet, but you don't seem to do anything about that. And she doesn't like the fact that you brush your teeth once a month, and you don't seem to be doing anything about that. And she doesn't like many things, but you ignore her. Now when it comes to the beard, you became obedient to your wife. Well, I'm looking after my wife's, you know, feelings and emotions. Nonsense. So sisters, don't put your husband in this position where you tell him, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't look good, you look dirty, something along his lines. This is unacceptable. You should help him obey Allah. You shouldn't help him disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So please don't, don't uh, disappoint us. You know, we need you, your husband needs you, for the, if you're a mother, your son needs you, if you're a sister, your brother needs you, remind them of Allah. Let them be men as they're supposed to be. Don't do it the other way around. The other thing I wanted to mention before we conclude is that if you really want to believe that beard and iman are harmonious, look at the new Muslims. You will hardly find a new Muslim who has been into Islam long enough to understand the deen without a beard. Right or wrong? Right. Why? Because these people entered into Islam because they were convinced that this is a religion of God. So when this new, their iman is still, you know, vibrant. So when this news came to them, they were happy to act upon it. And those who usually born into Islam, which live Islam as a culture, as a ritual, are the ones who may ignore this. Because their iman is not as vibrant as someone who entered into Islam. This to prove to you that beard and iman go hand in hand. Right? And lastly, I want to quote to you an, an incident that was narrated by Abu Ishaq al huwaini one of the students, Sheikh al-Albani. I saw this on, uh, you know, a video where uh, they, he was asked about the hijab and the beard. And he said that I met a man in the masjid. And this, this man used to have a big beard. And then I didn't see him for a long time. And then after a long time, I saw him and he had a very tiny beard. I mean, it was still starting to grow. So then he said, the man came and told me, I need to speak to you, to the sheikh. 
So the sheikhs had no problem. When they started speaking, of course, he told them the old story. Well, you know, there's this neighbor of ours, which I've fallen in love with, and blah, blah, blah. Of course, the same old story, you know, a man loved a strange woman whom he's not supposed to love and do anything with. Anyways, he wanted to go out with her in a haram way, and you know what was preventing him? His beard. Can you see it? Can you imagine a mutawah walking with a woman, you know? Huh? It's like, what? This doesn't look right. Unless he's like a Harley Davidson, you know, the rider. But would you imagine a man? And if you saw a man with a beard, with a woman around his arm, what would you think automatically? It's his sister. No, it must be his daughter. Your brain will refuse to believe that this is a, a righteous man, right? And that this is a wicked man. Because the beard will put that. But if you saw a shaven man with a woman around his arm, you may think many things. Well, she could be his girlfriend. She could be, she could be, she could be. Right or wrong? Right. So he said, the man told him, I was unable to go out with her until I shaved my beard. So the beard protects you. Because people with the beard, we have a responsibility. Right? And I'm reminding the people with the beards now. We have a responsibility to portray the bearded men in a befitting fashion. Because unfortunately today, some of us who have beards are the worst. So the people who don't have beards say, listen man, I wanted to become a mutawwi until I saw this mutawwi right there. So we become an excuse for them to disobey Allah. We shouldn't be. If you have a beard, you have more of a responsibility to show the people the true Islam. Right? So what is the point? The man wasn't able to disobey Allah and go out with this woman until he shaved his beard. When he did it, his soul allowed him. He said, okay, now I'm fine. I can go with her. And he did. So the beard is what? It will protect you bi azza wa jal. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it. So, brothers in Islam, inshallah, tonight, if you didn't shave your beard earlier, was the last. Alhamdulillah, I hope. From tomorrow, you're going to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror for a few minutes, say, hold on, man, but the brother said, but I really want to go to work clean shaven. But the brother said, but oh, this is tough. But be a man. For the sake of Allah, not for me, who cares what I think? Even if I see you next week clean shaven, who cares what I think? It's between you and Allah. Go out of the house like a man. With no razor whatsoever. And life goes on. People will criticize you, say, oh, now you're this, you're that. Khalli, iwalli. You don't like it, Habibi. We have so many walls in this world. Choose the most suitable one for you and bang your head against it until you're satisfied. I will not take my beard away. Inshallah you are my boss or the father of my boss or the boss of my boss or I don't care who you are. My beard shall remain on your face. You like me, you hire me. You don't like me, Allah will give me a better job than with a loser like you. Be strong because you will find some wicked mudir. Says, you know, I don't like the way you look now. Customers are not going to buy things anymore. Will the customer come to buy your beard or the product? Your product must suck if they have to look at your face before they buy it. Right? So, you know, make this strong move, inshallah. If I offended you, please forgive me. Don't have anything against me. Don't stop coming. Okay, keep it going. As I mentioned, imagine if you had a beard. Inshallah, you will have one. And I have to say this. Because we can't fake it anymore. We can't see the brothers without a beard because it makes me sad. Every time I see a brother with a beard. By the way, bearded men have a special link. You check it. You walk down the street, as soon as a bearded man sees another bearded man, there's love ala tool. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum as salam. <laughs> Mashallah. They've never met each other before. Your heart goes with him. Oh, my brother. How wonderful you look. Wallahi. Ask bearded men. Is it like a connection? It's like, okay, I know what you got. We're on the same stuff, brother. Alhamdulillah. But when you see a brother who doesn't have a beard, there's something in your heart, just like the Prophet Sallam. Say, brother, please, you know, but you can't say this to everyone. If every time you met a Muslim, say, brother, you better grow your beard, you will have no friends today. <laughs> so we have to, you know, you know, that's why we use the lecture to slam everybody. But be slammed and act accordingly, inshallah. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Jazakum Allah khairan. Any questions? It's fard, brother. As we mentioned earlier, according to the form of that, fard. Yes, but uh, this is applicable. Oh, this? No, Habibi. Leave it alone. Once you have it like this brother, if it grows that long, you're on good terms, inshallah. You must leave it alone. If I did uh, in the same position, can I go to Jannah or not? I'm not the one who judges where you go, brother. <laughs> no, no, time out, man. Time out. Don't misunderstand me here. 
Jannah is not with me, it's no. with Allah. Time out. I can never tell you where you're going. Allah judges. I'm saying, if you want to obey Allah and His Messenger, you need to leave it alone. If you don't leave it alone, Allah will judge on the day of judgment where you're going. But you're sinning. If you keep it like this, you're sinning. Anything that is beyond, below or before the grip, you're sinning. Once it goes so long, if it ever goes so long, where you, you can take beyond the grip, you're on good terms, no problem. Allah Mustaq. Yes, sir. No, see. No, trimming the mustache is required. The, the, the question is, to what extent? Do you trim it so, like, nothing? Or do you just make sure it doesn't go be, below the lip? Or do you make it grow? There's a difference of opinion among the madahib. But they all agree you must trim the mustache. You can't have a big old mustache like this. You know, like these guys, you know, who flip it around and goes around and put it around the ears or something like that. You can't do that, right? It, and it, the idea behind it is that it doesn't go be below your lip because if you've ever had kapsa and you have a long mustache, you will re have a remaining of kapsa on your, on your mustache. There'll be a rice, you know, hanging like this. So in order to, you know, keep that clean, that area clean, you make sure it's above your upper lip. What about the mustache uh, to be clean, I mean, to shave? Generally, people are shaved with uh, lehia is like, what is the, because even the example in the, in the so you mentioned that all, all the mother had saying that trim. Trim, now. No, but see. To be shaved, nobody mentioned it to shave the. No, the word juzu, uh, ashawarib, you have to go back to the uh, interpretation of the Arabic terminology. It may indicate shaving. Okay? So, like I said, there's a difference of opinion. The Malikis were very stern against shaving the, the, the mustache. And they considered it a bid'ah. Other madhahib said it's fine. So, as long as you're doing something to the mustache, in the sense of trimming it, you're, you're doing good, inshallah. If you believe a certain madhahib is correct, then follow it. But who said you have to shave? Who said to shave the mustache? Yeah, yeah. Fully to shave and the hair is like... It's not like they said, like I said, the, the word juzu and other words used in the hadith do include the meaning of shaving. Remove meaning uh, in a, a lot. You know, so much so that it is nothing. Okay, inshallah? It is allowed to cut... Coloring the beard. I'm sorry? Something about coloring the beard. Yeah, if your beard is white and you wish to have it red, a code like hinna, or avoid green, you know, or anything, you know, that looks silly, then you may change the hair of your beard, uh, the color of your beard, right? But not black. Don't dye your beard black. If you're an old man, for the youngsters, this doesn't apply to, to you. But if your beard is long, I mean, it's big, or has gray hair, it is from the sunnah to change that gray hair. And you may leave it as well. It's not an obligation to change the color, but it's a recommendation. It is a recommendation that you change any gray hair in your beard. But many of the ulama kept it as is, and it is allowed to keep it as is. However, it's recommended that you change the gray hair into some other color, preferably hanna, but not black. Let me just deal with this, uh, Sheikh. Is it allowed to cut few hairs of beard to keep it in a good shape like we cut our hair's head? Uh, some of the ulama said if you have like an excessively long hair, which is like abnormal, they said it is okay. But many others said no. Even that, you leave it alone. So you follow an opinion which you find is befitting. But don't be careful of the shaitan tricking you. Because the beard is not going to look like somebody drew it. You know, it's all going to be 100% even. It's going to have, you know, it's going to scatter and go around. That's part of the beard. You, you know, where you get one of these for one or two years, and you make sure that, you know, all the time you keep it nice and clean. That's all you got to do. Yes, brother. Uh, what about sporting long hair nowadays? They said it's all right as long as you also make your beard go the same together, but not to shave this, make it long. So you just clarify. If you have a long hair with the intention to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ, not to imitate the rock stars and the crazy people, and you have a beard, you're not resembling the kuffar, then go ahead. But the problem with the youth today is, very often you think he's a girl. 
until he turns around, it's like a man. You see like a big old ponytail, you know, and he got curly hair. I don't know what he's doing at home. And I've been shocked so many times to see a person thinking he's a woman. I'm like, why is this woman not wearing a hijab and wearing pants? And it's a brother. So, I mean, the way you have your long hair plays a difference. If it looks like, you know, you're a good looking man and your hair looks decent, alhamdulillah, it's from the sunnah. The sunnah tabi'iyah, natural sunnah, you may, you know, the scholars have differed whether you will be rewarded for it or not. That's another discussion. Uh, but if you're looking like the wicked people, then no. Keep your hair short. Any other questions? You translated What's the ruling about the guys uh, use the hair band? Hair braid? Hair band. Yeah. Hair band. Yeah, I mean, like, no, brother, no. It's, it's resembling women. It falls under resembling women, not acceptable. Prophet didn't do that. He would have, you know, a different kind of hairstyles. He would, he would part his hair in the middle, alayhi salatu salam, but he didn't, you know, have anything of this nature. You translated the, the word uh, to perhaps. Perhaps. But I was under the impression that la lakum is concerned. No. La'alli araka ghadan, perhaps I will see you tomorrow. No, it means perhaps. What I read is, you know, if Allah says that it is. Now, the interpretation is a whole other discussion. And even the interpretation among the ulama, some of them still of the opinion that perhaps, still because it's Allah's choice. Mm. And some of them automatically assume that la'alla with Allah means for sure. But I, I prefer to be any more technical in the translation. I love you for the sake of Allah, for the men only. And subhanakallahumma bihamdik, shadu la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka atubu